afternoon. My name is Ken McIntosh, and uh, as Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, this is, as many of you will know, the 13th annual festival of politics. So we are, I've been celebrating with the theme of revolution and rebellion, th these being our teenage years. And today I am delighted to say that we're going to be joined uh, by our guest, Ken Clark, who's going to chat about uh, his autobiography. Uh, now, before we even start, though, I just remind you that this is an audience participation event, so I hope you'll be sharpening your minds and think of some questions for, for Ken, to throw to Ken. Before we even get to that stage, uh, if you're good on social media, can you use the hashtag uh, Festival of Politics 2017? That's FOP 2017. Some of you are going, no. <laughs> FOP, hashtag FOP 2017. So, um, now, I'm delighted uh, to be joined by uh, Ken Clark. He's been a, an MP for almost five decades and has become, yes, I know. The only non-controversial part of my career is its longevity. No one can argue about that. <laughs> <laughs> so now, with, with that length of unbroken services, has now become father of the house. Born in Nottingham in 1940, Ken began reading the Daily Mail at the tender age of five and announced to his peers at the age of seven that he was to become a politician. He attended Nottingham High School, went on to read law at Gonville and Keys College, Cambridge. He held the position of president of the Cambridge Union and he was called to the bar in 1963 and became a QC in 1980. At university, Ken joined the Conservative Party and his interest in politics gained momentum. After contesting the Mansfield seat in 64 and 66 general elections, he was elected to the House of Commons in 1970, winning the Rushcliffe seat. And his, in his long career, Ken has held various ministerial appointments, serving at the heart of government under three prime ministers. He has been Chancellor, Home Secretary, Lord Chancellor, Justice Secretary, Education Secretary, Health Secretary, and latterly, Minister Without Portfolio. And as well as politics, Ken has a keen interest in jazz, Formula One racing, he enjoys cricket, bird watching, Romanesque church architecture, and of course, football, supporting both Notts County and Notts Forest. Ah. Yes, we're going to it. And I understand he's also fond of real ale, Malbec wine, and cigars. So, uh, author of his new autobiography, Kind of Blue, I'm delighted to introduce you to the Right Honourable Ken Clark. So, Ken, I'm going to... Uh, this is two Kens talking to each other in Edinburgh. It's a you Ken, 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 you know. It's, you know. <laughs> um, we're going to go through, a, a, hopefully, part of your career and, and your political interests and so on over the years, but do you mind if I just start with the most topical question? And the question or the, the issue that's dominated, perhaps, your political life, and that's of Europe and Brexit. And can you just ask, does it make you sad or does it make you mad? Oh, both, really. Uh, it, it, it's going to be one of the ironies of my career. The, the first parliament I was in was one when Britain joined the European Community. I was actually a whip in the Heath government, helping get the majority for the European Communities Act when we joined. And when I started in politics, I, I, I became an active, decided that the Conservative Party was the party that was going to have the privilege of having me, and I finally made my mind up, and, uh, and uh, I joined because I was supporting, amongst other things, Macmillan's first bid to get Britain into Europe. So it's an irony that I look like being, a, you know, my last parliament looks like being the one in which we leave uh, the European Union. And I've been a supporter of the European project all through my life. I don't regret it. I think uh, if I wish to cheer myself up, I just think, well, at least I was there when we enjoyed the benefits of it. it we, we were a complete joke when we joined. I, was, I think I was very influenced by sewers and that kind of nonsense. Uh, and the fact that we were becoming a bit of an economic laughing stock, being left behind by the countries we'd beaten in the war and so on. And so my, to my generation, the European project, internationalism was already key. And I think it's on the strength of the last 40 odd years. Uh, we built up our, our status in the world. We have influence, if we have influence at all in the world as a small country, uh, very, but largely because we're one of the, seen as one of the leading influential members of the European Union. Uh, and we base most of our relationships with the world on being in the European Union. And particularly once the Thatcher government, I, 
led the way to creation of a single market. We moved on from just the common market and the customs union. Uh, that's how we've got a modern, competitive, successful economy in the modern world. And so I get uh, sad, bewildered, angry. I mean, it probably makes me, uh, in the opinion of some of my colleagues, you know, that, that, that typecasts me. I am of that generation of conservatives, uh, along with Heather and a few other well-known people, John Major and so on, uh, this was the basis of the Conservative Party. Uh, I, I now speak out as a distinct, uh, I'm not a minority, but amongst those who say anything, uh, I'm more outspoken, uh, at least pro-European now, than anybody else, but uh, I get on with the whips anyway, and they don't fool themselves, they're going to change my, me, me at all, so they... they, they uh, but I mean, if I had to explain it, I'd say, well, all I'm espousing is the politics of the Conservative Party for the last 50 years. It's, this is pure orthodoxy, the position I have now. Everybody else seems to have changed 18 months ago because of an opinion poll. Uh, but but, but I, 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 I haven't. And, uh, but it is, I've never seen a bigger mess, actually, because nobody knew what leave meant. So, <laughs> you say, as a preliminary before getting over a biography, you set me off. I mean, it's, it starts with getting bored in my last parliament. Uh, I, I, I can't, I don't have those moments where I think, oh, I've been here, done this, what am I still doing this for, Clark? Why, why couldn't you find something different to do? Uh, this is just crazy. I have no idea, and nobody else has, what's going to happen between now and Christmas. But my fundamental views remain the same, and it is a sadness. Uh, that, that I or see all this going on, this mad debate at the moment going on, uh, with no idea of what the next phase of, uh, is going to be, what's going to follow it, what Britain's role is going to be in the world, and how we are going to, uh, you know, meld into the 21st century and the globalised economy and so on. It's all to play for. Mm. Uh, I suspect we'll be coming back to that subject. So, Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, persistent at the moment. And may, half the public have got bored with it already because they only voted leave or remain. Um, rather, you know, last minute sort of uh, reasons. And, and no one ever talked about what the politicians are now all arguing about. None of this was mentioned by either side in the national media. The leading figures, there were no serious arguments presented in the national media, either in favour of remaining or of leaving, all the silly ones were the only ones that got presented. So this is totally new, and a lot of the less political public, the ones who haven't got much time for politics because they're too busy doing other things, you know, I think are already getting bored silly uh, by, by this diet of Brexit. I think they're going to, if they will buy newspapers, they're going to have to put up with it for, you know, a few years yet, but it is a very bewildering stone. Mm. So just to, if I may, to return to your, your early years and uh, just life in, in, in Nottingham. Can I ask, first of all, by the way, how can you support Notts County and Notts Forest? I don't. That's no, like no, supporting Celtic that. and you, Rangers you, simultaneously. I, I think I told it? you that I go to both of them when I'm around. I don't support <laughs> both. Uh, I go to both because yeah. I, I, I started going with my granddad when I was tiny. Uh, you know, tiny, it was in short trousers anyway. Uh, and uh, one week Notts County, next week Nottingham Forest. In fact... When asked then, when I was very small, I always said I was a supporter of Nottingham Forest. Now, why I chose Nottingham Forest rather than Notts County, I'm not sure. Uh, because I think it was because it had a funny name. It sounded a bit like Crew Alexander, you know, <laughs> or something like this. And also because Notts County then was the bigger... They both had enormous crowds. This is post-war, so they had enormous crowds. But the Notts County was a slightly more fashionable and in one because we got some ageing famous players like uh, Tommy Lawton and Jackie Sewell playing for them and so on. So I, the, the slight underdogs um, with the funny name were the ones I allied myself with. So if I'm asked which I support now, even when I'm in Meadow Lane, which is the ground of Notts County, I tend to admit that I'm a forest man, really. Mm. So, OK. So now you came from a fairly working class family, but your politics were probably shaped at university. You went to Cambridge and uh, in fact, you're famously part of what was called the Cambridge Mafia. There was a yeah, list well, of... I, uh, it, it was the brief phase of meritocracy in this country. As you say, I came from a very, the first 10 years in an obscure pit village in Derbyshire uh, and, and came from a completely non-political background, although I, I did have a communist grandfather 
uh, who, who's been a shop steward at the Rally Cycle Factory and all this kind of thing. But, but as I was keen on politics, so I just followed it. Uh, but it was, I was one of the first 11 plus days. And so there was a whole wave of people coming through. Uh, and a past 11 plus got sent to the local independent school, which it wouldn't happen now. I mean, that was given up even then by the Labour Party almost immediately. But uh, it was an academic sweatshop. And so then I wound up at Cambridge. And there was a whole lot of us there who'd all swept in. Um, and we were all interested in politics. It was a very political time. And probably one of the few times that the majority of the really politically active people all became conservative. And we all became rather seriously, obsessively conservative. There must have been something funny in the water or something because six of us wound up in conservative cabinets at one time or another. Uh, and because of a sudden wave of these young, we were all men coming out of Cambridge, and we acquired this nickname of the Cambridge Mafia, uh, which stuck to us. It's got people like Norman Fowler, Leon Britton, John Gummer, Norman Lamont. You know, there was whole Michael Howard, a whole lot of us. And we were first met all these guys. They're all friends of mine. Uh, I met all these guys at because uh, we were all active conservative students at Cambridge. And the one name, of course, that was also there. Uh, is Vince Cable. No. So Vince, Vince was a year or two behind me. Yeah, that, uh, I, I always tease. When I was president of the what, union... Whatever happened to him, by the way? <laughs> well, he went off for years and years. He vanished. It was only the Conservatives who went, became professional politicians. All the Labour guys went off to be academics. Uh, and absolutely none of them followed us in the House of Commons. One, two tribe never got there. Vince went off into the oil business, I think. And so years later, Vince turns up. I mean, he'd been active in the Labour Party, Social Democrats, gone with Jenkins, he was wound a up in the Liberals. In Glasgow, Labour uh, uh, and then he suddenly he turns up again. And I tease him, I can remember, he was a very good speaker at university. And so when I was president, I gave him his first paper speech in the union. The president had to select which undergraduates were going to join with our visitors to inter open the debate. It was your great moment if you, if you wanted to get elected in the union to, to uh, you were invite, invited to make a paper speech, you remember the paper speech, in, or wise it wasn't, uh, but you opened the debate. And Vince was a very good debater. So I, I was the first one to offer him a paper speech, I think, which I think he agrees. But, but Vince, so Vince suddenly broke our record, saying it was 100% Conservatives that come out of the Cambridge of the early 60s, uh, when you were joined eventually by a Liberal Democrat. Yeah. But uh, he's to the left of me, he's, but he doesn't we, disagree that much with me, you know. He's, um, <laughs> but, uh, he and I were in opposition. We were the only two. We were, I think we were regards a couple of old stages carrying on about the economic politics of Gordon Brown. We were quite alive then. Vin we Vince, would, would, the same way. Vince would not like to be called an old stager. He thinks he's going to be prime minister next, isn't that? <laughs> well, it? Well, yes. He said so at the last you never, Well, I, as, as I haven't a clue what's going to happen to politics, I've never known politics in such turmoil. You never know. You never know. <laughs> So um, if I may just um, fast forward slightly um, to, the, to, the, to the Thatcher government, because that was when you really had your break into, that, that was the, 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 the making of you, as it were, as a, as a cabinet minister. Would that be fair? And, and the yes, I, I had been, I'd been in the Heath government. I was in the Whip's office with Heath. But I, 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 uh, the Thatcher government, I, I served all the way through. I was one of the last survivors of the Long March because I, I, I was combining it with being a lawyer. I was a barrister. Everybody had outside jobs if you could get one in those days. It, 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 it was the only people on the conservative side who didn't have an outside job and earned their living doing something else had rolling acres and, and uh, you know, were aristocrats and or were just younger sons at least. Uh, so most everybody else went out and earned their living. And I was a barrister. And I put mothballs in my robes in 1979 when she finally rang me up and offered me a job. Uh, I'd been a shadow minister before that under her leadership uh, and thought, well, three or four years and I'd be back at the bar uh, because that's about the political life expectation of the average uh, politician appointed minister. And 18 years later, having my much reshuffled career, it was too late to go back to the bar, but I, had, I never imagined I'd have an 18-year 
slab in office, and it was first with her all the way through. And I think the only two people left the end who'd been in from the start all the way to the finish who were, uh, were Malcolm Rifkin to me, mm. because we'd been junior ministers when it started, and we were still there when the major government finally collapsed. But, yeah, and it's quite an experience working with Margaret. Uh, I always say it was great fun if you could stand the hassle, which I always could. But, uh, yes, I would work with you. The, uh, you, you, would, you would be described as, as a wet in, in those terms. Those she always regards me. Uh, the, 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 party, the Conservative Party has always gone in for civil war, you know, sometimes at a minor level, sometimes at a raging level. And the, La the Labour Party has always done the same thing. Uh, usually on their side, with more violence than on ours. But the, 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 um, that's because our parties are such broad coalitions. It's because of the first-past-the-post system. It's all, it's all breaking down. It's not working now. Uh, but, but you have this great range of opinions. Uh, you sort of compromise, decide to form a government, present a pre-packed coalition to the, the country... Uh, they're both very, very wide. They wouldn't be single parties in any other European democracy. Uh, Tony Blair and George Galloway were in the same party for 20 years, for heaven's sake. I mean, it, it, it's impossible. Uh, but but, but um, and, I mean, in those days, it was an argument allegedly between wets and dries. And I'm economic liberal, social liberal. I was an acolyte of Geoffrey Howe. Uh, I was just as, I'm a free, much, just as much a free marketeer as the Dries, but uh, very much a social liberal, certainly compared with Margaret. And she always regarded me wet, and I always said I was a wet when I was asked, which was very reckless of me. Um, but uh, it, it slightly distracted things. Uh, but it, she never quite trusted me. She, I think my friends had to persuade her to, to appoint me to various jobs, I think, at various stages. Because uh, I was always told that she would say to the people she was combined with, is he one of us? And she was never quite sure that I was one of us. And if you meant vehement Thatcherites, no, I was not one of us. She was quite right. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that was the background. And I had lots of rows with her, but she loved political rows. And if you, as long as you held your own, she usually didn't mind. Uh, and and we, I, I, I enjoyed working in it. But it could be quite a hassle at times. It, it, it was, a, I mean, a, clearly a time of political turmoil itself. I mean, one of the one of the biggest events, for example, would be. It was, I, it was the best government I ever worked. She was the best prime minister I ever worked for, and it was the best government uh, I ever was in, and best government since the war, the possible exception of the Attlee government, I would say. That's my view. Now, th that that all sets people off, because Margaret was nothing if not divisive. She arouses great emotions. And the mythology that surrounds the Thatcher government is quite comic, really. Both of the right, the ones who think she was a kind of goddess figure who walked on water, and attribute to her uh, all kinds of ultra-right-wing opinions, not all of which she held. She was never a very hardline Eurosceptic in office. It never, never, never crossed her mind to leave the European Union. Uh, and, and, and the left, you know, she ate children and she... But, uh, she closed down uh, our great industrial you know, working class society and if it wasn't for her, the lasses would still be in their clogs rattling over the cobbles on way to mill and she deliberately set violent police upon them all. So the, the, the whole thing was actually, it, it was a very can-do government. It was, it was free market economics with a social conscience uh, and it was to use a jargon word, it was the structural reform of a failing out-of-date economy, which, which had to be done. Uh, and she gave us the courage of our convictions. People like Jeffrey Howe, all the way down to me, we, we were free marketeers. We deeply deplored this stagnant post-war uh, thing which had built up uh, vast numbers of nationalized industries all losing money, all being propped up, all uncompetitive. Uh, and everybody resisting change. Uh, and it was hard work. It was very controversial, all the changes. But we, we, we did produce modern, more free market-based, more competitive economy, uh, and we altered the labor laws and everything else, and liberalized, made our labor laws more flexible. 
um, and the country was, which was very demoralized when we took over after the winter of discontent and all this, uh, it, 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 I think, restored a quite great deal of national self-confidence and everything else. We were much clearer about our role in the world uh, after a few years of Margaret. And so here I am, I'm now making a part of political speech on behalf of the Thatcher mm -hmm. government. But it, 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 it's, um, yeah. it was exciting to be in it. And she moved me around quite a bit in it. But from beginning to end, uh, she was never quite sure about where I fitted in, but uh, it, it, she... She, she gave me some extremely good jobs. And I became increasingly notorious as I got into my more controversial ones. So I emerged as a public figure. We didn't have all these PR people then. There was none of this message discipline and so on. If, if you were in a difficult, uh, which is why the politicians are all so unpopular now, because they take too much notice of lightweight public relations men, in my opinion, you went out there and you argued your case. And well, I, Several of the jobs I did, I spent my life going out there arguing the case, sometimes competing to be the most unpopular man in the country. But ma 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 making a case for change, why we were doing it, why it had to be done, in a government that was changing a lot, in my biased opinion, very successfully. Nobody's ever attempted to reverse it. Well, I think we'll come back to a few of these points. Uh, I'm quite pleased you've, you've made them, because I actually suspect it will have sparked a number of questions in the... The, the, including a uh, free market with a social conscience. I suspect many people would raise an eyebrow at that. But can I... Well, it's a, phrase, it's a phrase I've always used. Uh, to have a, Mrs. Knight herself a, said there's no such thing as society. Would, uh, how can you have a social yeah, that was that's, uh, that's been totally... It's one phrase. It's just a silly phrase. It's, of course, it's not true. There is such a thing as society. I think she was in the middle of an interview arguing about uh, society en bloc. And she was saying, well, actually, society is composed of lots of individuals. I mean, it's a silly remark, taken literally. But the, I, I say the, the mythology of Mrs. Thatcher, mm. that somehow she was a heartless, right-wing uh, sort of I, you know, ideologue, all that all mm. rubbish, as is the... As is the right-wing equivalent, that she was some Bodicea figure who was fighting foreigners and uh, uh, putting down, you know, resisting revolution and ultra-libertarian and all that. She wasn't any of that stuff. Uh, she, she was right of centre. She was much more right-wing than me. She was on the right-wing edge of the party, and she was impulsive. But I think free market economics with a social conscience is the description which somebody like me, a right of centre person would give and and nowadays it's, it's what's collapsing now I I, I, I was, have to admit I'm probably part of the political establishment of the 1990s in the end economic liberals social liberals internationalist you know Blairite come one nation conservative and we we, we, we all got complacent. We, we, that was the politics of the Western world for most of the last 20 years. And at the moment, large sections of the public got fed up with it. It's not worked, and it's all collapsing, and angry, populist, uh, hard-right, hard-left politics is sweeping it all away. In most of the democracies of the Western world, including, if we're not careful, the United Kingdom. Well, again, we'll, we'll probably return to some of these. Before we do, and, and I want to open... It up. So please, can you just raise your hand and catch my eye in between questions, and I'll try and bring you in for, to ask a question. Um, just to ask, in two seconds here, just to ask, uh, perhaps to cast Mrs. Thatcher in a more sympathetic light, a remark you made recently, you, you, you suggested that you thought that she was suffering from dementia in her later years. Well, that, that was when I was being asked about her fall, which is, said that, but I was, obviously was involved in that a bit. She'd lost the plot. She... she Ten years is the maximum permitted dose for adults, is the Clark theory of leading a country or a political party. <laughs> and after that, either hubris or losing your judgment takes over. And she had lost her judgment. She was flying by the seat of her pants, trying to do everything herself when she shouldn't have done. Uh, and I, as an after, I just was a passing remark, said, you know, looking back, because uh, she was comparing her last year or two in office with the commanding figure she'd been five years ago, the much more collective figure. I mean, who knows? Some of the early stages of dementia may be coming. 
Again, in this mad age, that was the only newsworthy thing I said. You know, I mean, if you look at this morning's newspapers, which I've only done one or two, most of the quotes of politicians are half a sentence, half a phrase from the middle of a sentence, spun out of all proportion and given a meaning it never intended. But I, I think it is possible she was suffering, but I don't know. It wasn't meant to be a profound thought. Uh, who knows if she was, because she became... Sadly, she suffered very badly from dementia quite quickly after she lost office. So perhaps what I describe as losing her judgment, it perhaps was the beginning, the onset of the symptoms. If I may, I'm just going to bring in a few members of the audience just to ask uh, some questions here. Gentlemen, yes, sitting on the edge of the... Yes. Yes, if, if, actually, if you Sorry could stand... Sorry, I'm turning awkwardly. I've got a stiff neck. I if you could stand up, just simply because it actually helps. We're, we're on Facebook Live and it helps the cameras find you. So ah, you. right, OK. Do you want me to use the mic? Oh, sorry, yeah, no, right. just speak like that, it'll pick uh, you up. Mr Clark, back in 2005, um, a Conservative MP who is now a member of Mrs May's Cabinet told me, uh, who was supporting David Cameron for the leadership, told me that you were the candidate that most non-Conservative voters would probably support, hence why he was supporting David Cameron. So with that in mind, I would be interested to know how you feel your own party, the Conservative Party, um, how its history would have evolved had you been leader in one of your um, attempts to, to lead the party? I know how would have evolved had I been leader? Yes. You stood three times, Ken, so... I say, yeah, well, I, I will say it's the only bad habit I've ever given up, is standing for the leadership <laughs> of the Conservative Party. <laughs> oh, who, who, who knows? You know, the, the, the other thing... This isn't because I, one of the things interviewers often put to me, you know, I belong to that club of the best Prime Minister we never had, you know, with Dennis Healy and Roy Jenkins and all that. And, and I always say it's a great club to belong to because nobody ever had the chance of discovering how awful you were uh, when you actually took over. No, I have no idea. Um, the, 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 the one that I should have won, really, uh, I was excited. The first two I, I, was, I was the, the media favourite I expected to win, you know. Uh, now, the first one, uh, had I won in 1997, that would have been a disaster because nobody was going to meet, beat Tony Blair in 2001. And it, but it was a bad mistake for William Hague to beat me um, because uh, he would have taken over from me when I resigned in 2001. Uh, and the one, the one to win was the 2005 election. Had I, it was the one after that that... Had I won that, I'd like to think I possibly could have, could have been Prime Minister because Tony Blair was walking on water. He was the, the Kennedy figure of Britain when he was first elected. Uh, well, after 2001, this was wearing off, uh, and particularly because of the warfare with Gordon Brown, uh, it was all beginning to collapse. Now, had I won in 2001... Uh, and had I persuaded the Conservative Party, which I think I would have done, actually, to oppose the invasion of Iraq, then I think we could well have beaten him in 2005. Uh, I, I think that was all quite possible. Uh, and instead of which, instead of being a fight between me and Portillo in 2001, Portillo failed to turn up. He got beaten. Uh, just to the post by Ian Duncan Smith. And then the, the, the Conservative Party was going to have to choose between Portillo and me. We were the obvious candidates. But the Conservative Party membership, who had been brought into the election by this stage, we always change our system every now and again, uh, there were quite a lot of them that didn't want to vote for anybody named Portillo or Clark. We'd both become quite controversial figures. they never heard of this chap called Duncan Smith, so they all voted for him. Uh, and that, that, was, that was the best chance when Ian beat me in the runoff. That was the best chance when I might have won. What I, where things would have been in 2005, I don't know. Uh, they'd only given up, the Labour Party had only given up my economic policy a few years before, because for the first three years they stuck to my figures and all this stuff. It might have been possible in 2005 to have averted the crash. I think it probably would have been. We were going on extremely recklessly. It would have been quite unpopular, 
people like free money and everybody getting richer all the time and, and you know, getting more and more excited that it's... Uh, and people like me and Vince Cable were dismissed as people, you know, boring old so-and-sos who didn't understand the new paradigm when we criticised what was going on. But again, might possibly have pulled it together. On the other hand, as I said at the start of this long answer, I might have, might have made a complete horlix of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and the 2008 <laughs> crash might have finished me off you know, completely and uh, shortened my career. Okay. Mary, just there, sorry. To uh, the Leavers and Brexiteers, a silly people. So I just wonder, oh, yeah, in light, sorry, of, I, 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 in light I, of that... Just start, start again. Just, silly people. I'm sorry I'm you, craning around to hear you. I've got a stiff that's neck. A, <laughs> Earlier you referred to the leavers and Brexiteers as silly people. And I just wondered in light of that comment, do you think Theresa May was wise to put Liam Fox, David Davis and Boris in charge of EU negotiations? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think I, rec I don't think I refer to all leavers as silly people. That, 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 whatever I that there is a the silly element. There's a silly element on the Remain one as well. Uh, the, 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 uh, but, but I do sometimes refer to the hardline fanatic Eurosceptics, to whom it has, for whom the cause has a religious quality, which I, I just don't quite understand. I, I'm afraid I do rather rudely refer to them as the headbangers, uh, and they are making a lot of the the, the, the pace and, and noise at the moment. But uh, I thought it was a good idea when Theresa took over this impossible situation because it, you know, I've always, I think it was a reckless, irresponsible decision to, to, to uh, call a referendum in the first place. I never thought, I don't think a referendum is a sensible way of running a country in the modern world, particularly with such an enormous complex question with hundreds of sub-questions. So she takes over when both sides are absolutely amazed to discover that lay leave has won. And it, it was quite good party management tactics uh, to, to, to put the foreign affairs things in the hands of the now victorious Leave side. But it has made it extremely difficult to get the cabinet, a cabinet which is actually able to agree on any substantive issue about where we're now going and what Leave means. Because the one thing that was never raised in the referendum was what exactly do you mean by leave? Because I never met anybody, politician, pundit, journalist, who were first moment thought that leave might win. If you remember on the night, Farage had gone to bed uh, <laughs> and, and, and had to be woken up. So he, he made some remark you know, saying the fight continues because none of the leavers had the slightest intention of taking any notice of the result. Uh, they, they, they were going to just carry on and then demand another one in a few years' time. Uh, and it, a broad-based cabinet was essential when she started, but the main thing that's holding things up now is that the British government is not able to form a terribly comprehensive view of what exactly now wants to happen. And that snag is being caused by the wide range of views. I mean, the Labour Party's in the same mess, but Jeremy's so excited at the thought that he might become Prime Minister, he's allowed himself to go along with a rather pro-European platform. And, and I don't know quite how Keir Starmer's managed it, uh, but they've got a slightly more coherent position than we have. But there's a full range of views in cabinet and shadow cabinet, and it does make it difficult. We are bewildering our friends. I think the main reaction on the cabinet, on the continent, is that they just do not understand what on earth is going on hmm. to the Anglo Saxons on either side of the Atlantic. I'll take some more questions if I can, Ken, from over here. Now, there was a couple of people across the line. Yes, yes, women at the back there first, yeah. And then we'll go to the man in the balcony. Women first. Following on from that last question and a lot of what you've said about the chaos and the potential um, disaster, <laughs> or potential disaster, is there any chance, do you think, that we might be able to avert leaving 
I'm more pessimistic than most people who were Remainers. I, I don't think there is. It's the, 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 the political class as a whole, and leaving aside eccentrics like me, as I say, I think I was mainstream until 18 months ago, uh, but, but, but they, they've all decided that this referendum is a, a kind of instruction from on high. It is the voice of the people. Uh, and and it, it can't be challenged. Now, whether that will change, it won't change in a hurry. And I, I, I don't think Parliament could bring itself to that. They're all, they're all terrified of the right-wing newspapers. They'd be accused of being saboteurs and enemies of the people if, if they stick to the opinions they had before the referendum. Uh, I, 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 and... Uh, uh, they do, genuinely. I mean, a lot of them, to be fair, to my colleagues, so I'm, sounding very, I'm getting very coarse and critical. It's my stiff neck and getting grumpy old man. Uh, but, but they did all say of the referendum they were all going to be bound by it. So they do regard themselves as bound by it. So I, I think there is little doubt we're going to leave. It would require an extraordinary turn of events, I think, to stop. So I tend to concentrate and forgive the bias I'm showing throughout all this, but there's no point in my... You all know where I come from on Europe. Um, the, 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 the Minimising the damage, getting as normal a relationship as possible, is the best we can really do. We might get there yet. The, we, we, I find this argument about the single market and the customs union, which politically interested people who come to a festival of politics have probably kept up with, I don't think most of the public have, uh, but they, 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 I don't understand why we're leaving them. Nobody, nobody said at the referendum we were altering our trading relationships with the European Union. Boris Johnson, who made himself the leader of the Leave campaign, dismissed any suggestion that we were changing our trading relationships. It was politics of fear, all that sort of thing. That, that it was all going to carry on unchanged. The Germans needed to sell us their Mercedes. The Italians need to sell us their Prosecco. Boris was fond of saying that. Uh, we can have our cake and eat it, he, he actually said. And so we'd have just carry on having normal free trade. Well, the, the free trade we can enjoy is, is if we stay in the single market and the customs union. And I don't remember, I never, nobody got reported in the national media arguing that we should come out of either. Eurosceptics used to say that the, oh, the economics of Europe is all right, we don't mind the common market, that's all right. It's the wicked politics. They frighten their children at night by this plot to form a United States of Europe. It's all a terrible, terrible secret plot being hidden by all the politicians uh, to abolish all the nation states and create the United States of Europe. Many of them still believe that. Uh, but but uh, there was none of this, let's, the idea that we're, oh, we're going to come out and we're going to put up a lot of tariff barriers and we're going to have different regulations, we're going to start having building lorry parks for the customs checks, that was not a big feature of the Leave campaign in the referendum. Uh, and so I still have hopes that that much might be salvaged at the moment. Well, I'm trying to press this as we obviously need a transition period, because we haven't the faintest chance of agreeing very much at all with the pace we're going uh, before March 2019. We have a transition period and just stay in the single market and the customs union. So it, but I, I still think in the end, you're going to have to negotiate what changes it, because it is regarded by the vast majority of the political establishment as now predestined that we're going to cease to be a member. I was astonished to find I was the only Conservative that voted against Article 50, but it was a fairly good indication of uh, what was in the wind. The, the party that had been the most pro-European party, together with the Liberals, uh, for all my lifetime, suddenly all but one uh, was voting to leave. So if, if Boris Johnson has been suggesting that we can stay in the customs union, should he stay or should he be sacked? I wouldn't sack Morris. I mean, because the actual politics, in a way, quite entertaining. The politics of the last uh, few weeks has been completely mad. Uh, and the one thing that uh, has dominated the reporting of the politics is the personalities. 
Uh, I, I try to avoid being one of those politicians who always blames the media. The media are only as bad as the politicians allow them to be. But, I mean, there's not much serious reporting of what it is we're supposed to be negotiating. It's all, you know, is Theresa going to stay? Is Boris up? Is Boris down? Is uh, Philip Hammond up? Is Philip Hammond down? Is she going to sack Boris? Is it, I st I've stopped giving interviews to the media for about a week because that was all they wanted to talk about. And I'd done a bit of Boris bashing, but it's, it's, uh, other people were doing it with more enthusiasm, so I left them <laughs> to get on with it. Uh, I, 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 and uh, you're not going to... What they need is to calm down, ignore the media for a week or two, get some medium-term, long-term view, and put in some effort into agreeing on whatever compromise they're trying to reach on what it is we want to negotiate and what exactly we are seeking to put in place for our long-term role and our long-term relationship with the European Union. And at the moment, we're only bothering with trade and investment and all that, and the, the, that relationship. There are dozens and dozens of other subjects that we haven't even looked at yet, uh, uh, all of which have to be resolved. I'll take some more questions from the floor. The chap on the balcony there with this. Uh, just follow on that. The political establishment were completely dumbfounded that people left, and I, including myself, you know, is there any way the politicians can reconnect now with the public? I, I feel that they're not connecting properly now. They, they seem to think they were the elite and they could do it and look after everything. And suddenly, when they've asked everybody to vote, the votes went the wrong way, and they're completely lost now. So I, I hope I, I only heard that in part. The, can the politicians reconnect with the general? Well, I'll start giving you a bit of my pet Clark theory which isn't in the book, actually, but the, and the, this is a problem in every Western democracy. And, and I, I personally haven't worked out quite why it's happening. Uh, to someone like myself who, you know, I hope I wasn't an establishment figure when I started, but as I say, I got, became so, you know, re, re, in establishment politics, I'm a classic 1990s, early to, to 2000s politician, and it's all changed, it's all gone. Uh, and in every Western democracy, the traditional parties have lost their, their old hold. They find it very difficult to keep it. Uh, and the public hold the political establishment pretty near contempt in many places. The political parties are unpopular institutions. And, and voting is the mass of the population don't automatically think they belong to a party anymore. Most young people make their minds up without, under the age of 50, make their minds up who they're voting for about two days before polling day. Uh, and they're not, depends what's uppermost in their minds at the time. There's a lot of angry protest. And so, you know, in America, Donald Trump defeated the Republican Party. He took their candidature. Uh, which every expert would have told you he hadn't a chance. He then defeated the Democrats, took the presidency. And he's still making it up as he goes along. But it was actually a, a protest against, you know, Washington, the establishment. Uh, we had the referendum, so that was. Four of our parties, every party but UKIP, was in favour of staying in the European Union. So, so they all voted with Nigel Farage. Uh, I, 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 and uh, we, we're out. Uh, the French looked as though Madame Le Pen was going to do a power of no good. She's been very nasty, probably the most racist. We, we haven't got any, we, there was a lot of dog whistle racism in some of the UKIP campaigning, but that, you know, on one side, they, 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 they absorbed the National Front and people. But, but they, 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 in, in, Madame Le Pen looked quite a threat. Then a bloke called Macron appears, sweeps away both political parties. Hollande, Sarkozy, all in the dust. Alain Juppé, who I would probably have voted for if I'd been a Frenchman at first, but I'd probably have voted for Macron in the end. Suddenly you had this unknown bright young hope, swept everything away, new political party, 
He better be good, because otherwise we economic and social liberals are finished if he makes a mess of it, but, but he's something like that. Now, Angela's just about held on. The one place that's remained normal, thanks to my great heroine, Angela Merkel, has clung on. Um, and uh, I won't go on, because there are these movements. Which we'll see how the Five Star Movement do in Italy soon. And it's, um, it's an angry rejection of politicians. There's a rejection of the modern world. It's all so complicated. And a lot of people have been hurt and have missed out. And they, no one's really sorted out the aftermath of the 2007 credit crash and the 2008 slump. Uh, and a lot of people have got left behind and been forgotten about. And they, they, they uh, and people want, you know, they, they, they want scapegoats. Uh, they want a simple answer. It's all the Mexicans, if you're an American. Uh, it, it, it's all the immigrants, if you're, you know, French. If it, it's all Brussels, if you're British. Uh, and, and you get these sweeping movements. Now, the fault lies, in part, with the conventional politicians. Firstly, we really have got to sort out the global economy and put it on a less fragile state, which will take a few years more. Uh, but more importantly, somebody, apart from Macron, has got to work out how to engage with the public uh, and, and you know, on a way which does not remind them of what too many of the public regard as the discredited old political establishment which they wish to get rid of. Uh, and and uh, anyway, that's a, a larger view of the whole thing. But uh, And then the other way in which governments can connect to the key things, sort of simple things like looking as though you're competent, actually being competent, delivering some sensible decisions and policies. They'll all be unpopular. Public deeply dislike change. No good government's ever popular in the first half of its term of office. But then once it starts to work through, people can see why you did it. It seems to be getting better. No point in taking a risk by trying the other lot. You know, so we get, but that's the politics I'm used to. Margaret Thatcher never had a popular policy the entire time she was in. But we, 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 we always won the elections. We, 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 we were miles behind in the opinion polls halfway through. Miles and miles behind sometimes. Uh, but, but uh, you know, you stuck to delivering government and it had a certainly unusual and different way of engaging with the public and ex arguing the toss about what we were doing, why we were doing it, and answering our enemies. Now, you have, politicians don't do that nowadays. They hire PR men who tell them to use slogans and not talk about policy and don't argue on popular things. It's, uh, that's why they all lose. You, you, I think actually you say that in your book as well, that when you first, when you're Margaret Thatcher's cabinet, the cabinet actually discussed issues. Whereas yeah. you think modern cabinets don't discuss issues, it's all departmentalized and run by, by PR. Well, there have been attempts to be that, yeah. Spitting image was one of the things that created one of the myths about Margaret's cabinet. And so if, if you remember, you know, so they, they built up this marvelous image uh, 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 of, uh, you know, there are all these jokes about and what about the vegetables? Oh, they, they'll choose them themselves and all this kind of thing. Uh, and she was pretty bad, but it wasn't quite like that it, it, at, at all. And we did have genuine cabinet government. Uh, now, Margaret spoke for half the time. She spoke for as much herself. She was a very bad chairman of meetings in a way because she, she spoke as much as all the rest put together. She'd always start discussion by telling us what she wanted to agree to. Uh, and, and then a great lively debate would take place. Sort of, sort of, uh, but we did talk about policy. And if you had a policy, you, you, went, you took it through cabinet committees. And if you couldn't get agreement with your colleagues in the cabinet committees, you went to cabinet and you got approval. That was then government policy. And she, she didn't win them all. She'd take defeat with very bad grace sometimes, but she didn't always win. Uh, and actually, we all did compromise. And I think one's colleagues improved the, 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 the policy. I like running politics as a debating society anyway. So actually, having your colleagues test what you think are your brilliant proposals uh, before you've gone out and announced it can actually be quite challenging. And, and sometimes you do go away 
and start thinking, you know, well, I'm not sure we've got this quite right yet, and, and try again. So we did a lot of that. And so she, she did do that. And it was Blair, I blame, for getting rid of all that, really. Blair had no time for all, any of this stuff. Uh, and uh, Blair couldn't understand he was going to be prime minister, and he got all these American experts who explained to him how he won elections, and he got Alistair Campbell, who was a prize journalist, who come in and going to help him run the country, uh, and uh, he didn't understand why Parliament should debate and vote about all these things in the name of family-friendly hours. He tried to get rid of most of that. And he didn't understand uh, why the cabinet should spend much time. I was reliably informed once that uh, this very early on they made the Bank of England independent. And uh, I think the then cabinet secretary is around, so I hope he doesn't object to my saying this, but I'm not sure he was my source, so he can't really. But, and the, 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 the cabinet secretary asked there, well, shouldn't we take this to cabinet? To which the reply was, what's it got to do with them? Uh, and, and control freakery and message discipline and all this stuff was introduced by Blairites and a lot of other politicians at first were awed by this. You know, this is professionalism. This is how they run it in America. This is unlike all this amateur stuff that we've had before. And I don't think cabinet discussions has ever quite recovered from that. And people all start with cabinet discussions. Cameron did, and John Major did. The problem also has happened is modern 24-hour media, everything leaks. And the one thing that stops a cabinet working is some of your cabinet colleagues going off, either directly briefing journalists with an improved version of what's just happened in the cabinet, uh, or gossiping to their aides, and their aides go off and have a drink with journalists and tell everyone what's happened. Uh, and, and this happened to the major cabinet, to be fair, before Blair. We, we stopped being able to do a lot of things in cabinet because it was all leaking all the time and spun campaigning versions of the discussions just appeared in the newspapers. So. If that was going to happen, you know, if you had a departmental minister, you were blown if you were going to talk about your subject in cabinet, if it was just going to be used as the basis for an attack on you afterwards. And I think that that still continues. That's a bit of a problem now. Mm -hmm. uh, Theresa certainly started by saying, she said to me once, that she wanted to go back to proper cabinet government. And if her colleagues behave themselves and don't leak, I think it would be very wise to do that because obviously they've got to get more agreement amongst themselves on the most difficult issue, which is how to handle Brexit again. Yeah. i take some more questions here. Now, something just caught my eye. Just... <coughs> Put your hand before your eye. I'll take that woman there, and then, oh yes, that man there. So I'll take the woman there, and then the man there. Right. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Clark, can I ask you another Brexit-related question? Um, and it's another one that's... Can that you speak in... up a little? Sorry. I'm... Is that any better? OK, good. Um, can I ask you another Brexit-related uh, question and uh, something that does seem to be dividing your party at the moment, which has been reduced to the game show slogan of deal or no deal. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering, the, the people that think uh, we can walk away from uh, this with, with no deal, um, what, I mean, do you, how do you perceive the consequences of that? Um, and how do they believe that, we've, that we really can just walk away without a deal? I think, again, I'm only, this is probably, I'm not that hard of hearing, but I have nothing to do with it. So, so how do I see no deal and all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I do think no, that no deal is very unlikely because there's, there's nobody on either side of the channel, no sensible person engaged in government or politics or, or business on either side of the channel, who thinks that no deal is somehow desirable. Uh, it would be totally disruptive. It's, it's, it's dressed up and made to sound very grand and organized by being described as trading under WTO arrangements. Well, the World Trade Organization does exist, and there are, there are fallback rules which we've managed to get in the WTO, but they're, they're far from perfect. They're for countries that haven't got trade agreements, and we weren't able to improve them. The Doha round failed. So uh, what, what happens is 
again, sticking as we are at the moment in most of our debate to, to questions of trade and so on, leaving out air flights and environmental standards and all the other things, and security, international crime. Uh, as far as trade's concerned, you would have quite substantial tariffs and you'd have to have customs barriers and new custom systems and you'd have to have regulatory uh, differences or less you wouldn't have to have because none of the levers can think of a regulation they want to change yet, but they all say they're going to. Uh, and uh, it would be totally disruptive. It plainly, I don't know how much it would damage the movement of trade and investment, but it's, in my strongly free trade opinion, it's a wholly inferior situation to the one we're in now. So Brexit's already made us poorer with the devaluation. Uh, it would make us poorer still if we, well, to a degree which plenty of people tried forecasts, nobody really knows, uh, but we will be poorer than we'd otherwise be. Now, uh, holding it out as an option, some people say is a good way of bargaining, negotiating. Um, uh, so you, you should keep saying that, that no deal is better than a bad deal because that means the Europeans take you more seriously. I don't agree with that because I don't think anybody on the continent thinks we seriously mean it. Uh, that no deal would be a failure and a disaster. And it's not something, if, you, if you're just using it to threaten them as a bargaining ship, I mean, Macron more or less said as much yesterday. He doesn't actually seriously think that uh, anybody on the other side thinks no deal is going to be anything other than disastrous for the United Kingdom. Um, but there's a great range of deals, and it all depends what it is you're trying to negotiate, what your, the, the, the thing you should have in mind in any negotiation is what is your end game. Uh, and you certainly should keep some of your, quite a lot of your end game secret from the other people once you've decided what it is. What is holding up things at the moment, I think most of all, is no one's quite sure what the end game is is and uh, that's what we've got to clarify um, but some things like what is the point in restoring tariff barriers between ourselves and 27 countries on the continent what is the point of building huge lorry parks so we can have go back to full customs procedures and then you know as, you, as no lever can ever identify a regulation, a market regulation, which a British government ever opposed, the British like regulations, all the ODIs right to me demanding more regulations of this, that, and everything else. I'm a bit, of, I'm mildly deregulatory myself, but you, we, we have we want very high standards of consumer quality, product quality, animal welfare, health and safety, environmental rules. No lever's ever been able to identify seriously to me any European regulation which they want to change. They're not one that any British government ever opposed. They get stumped, middle stumped, if you ask them which one are you thinking of changing. Or sometimes they produce rather obscure and batty ones, but there's no, 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 no mainstream one. Uh, and uh, we just don't need to introduce all this. Um, and, and you're not giving up too much if you say that no deal is a, a very undesirable. It'd be very bad for the Europeans as well. Other Europeans would be disastrous for us. There's no great concession in saying, let's forget all this no deal stuff, uh, uh, but let's get down to some serious negotiations about just how far we are going to remain integrated with the market and the rest of Europe how far we're not. The, objec the objections which serious leavers have to not just signing up and staying, say, stay in the single market, stay in the customs union, my position, is not that there's anything wrong with the single market. What they say is, uh, if you stay in the single market, you've got to have freedom of movement of labor, so we can't. To which my answer is, well, why don't we try negotiating some changes to the freedom of movement of labor? I don't feel strongly about it as you do, uh, but let's see if we can find something that reassures you. Uh, and when I say stay in the customs union, uh, they, they say, oh, we can't stay in the customs union uh, because then we couldn't have trade deals with anybody else. To which my reaction is, uh, well, how easy do you think it's going to be to get 
trade deals with all these other people and get better ones than the ones we've negotiated so far through the EU by being the country that urges the EU on to get these deals. Uh, and I know Liam Fox needs something to do, but is that quite a good enough reason uh, for leaving the customs union? And, but concentrate on, because nobody ever says there's anything wrong with the customs union. In principle, we're all free traders, so it's fine. And nobody says there's anything wrong with the single market, because we're all free traders, and apparently that's what we're going to agree with the Filipinos or, or somebody uh, quite shortly. Uh, it's these conditions. It's, oh, well, it comes with freedom of movement of labour, and it comes with our not being able to do unilateral deals with the Australians. So uh, try and address that if you can. The second one's difficult. The first one's not too difficult. You can address that if you like. You are, it's a difficult negotiation. Another question, just a man there, yes. Oh, sorry, yes. Okay, man up there, yes, though, sorry. Hold on. Given your blind scepticism of the uh, referendum, do you think that constitutional referendum are fundamentally different and should perhaps always have two components? First, that we've had on Brexit to agree in principle what people want to do if they want to leave the EU, but always a second check that those people are actually getting what they want if they're going to change everything for everyone for the next 50 years. That's, so is it unreasonable to have that valid, validification that people are getting what they want? Yeah, well, let's just make clear, I'd, I'd be very careful here as an English politician in, uh, uh, in Scotland. Uh, Scottish referendums, I did vote for the Scottish referendum on the basis it was a Scottish issue as to whether they had it or not. And, and actually the great thing, whatever else, it, although it's not a simple question, because Lord knows what flows from Scottish independence. I mean, rebuilding a border uh, between Scotland and England, not easy. Uh, but but, but the, 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 um, I was, all right, have a Scottish referendum, that was fine. The, 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 in the Brexit case, uh, I just think it was unsuitable. I mean, in my book, I described the row I had with Cameron. He, 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 like Harold Wilson, who held the other one on the same subject, it was all party management. That's all they're interested in. Uh, their, their parties was divided. They had noisy minorities on the subject. Uh, and in both cases, fondly imagined they would quieten down the row by giving them a referendum didn't quieten down anything, livened it up quite a lot on both occasions. Um, and I wouldn't hold a referendum at all on a big broad brush issue like that. It, it, it is essentially government by opinion poll. And I'm a Democrat, I'm a total Democrat. Uh, parliamentary democracy organizes it. The people do things and then they're accountable for the consequences in the parliamentary government. You get sacked when you've made a mess of it. Uh, but to, you know, the next time we're thinking of going to war to say we must have a referendum and ask about it, I mean, the Iraq war, 70% of the public were in favor of it, the invasion of Iraq in the opinion polls. When I re rebelled against Duncan Smith's lead on the Iraq war, I thought his, I'm going to get myself in a real mess here because 70% of the public uh, think it's a good idea. A year later, you couldn't find anybody who'd ever met anybody who was in favor uh, of invading Iraq. It's not no way of running a whelk store, certainly not a country. Now, the, on the point that having had one, the broad question of principle, quite a narrow majority, voted leave. For, for, again, the other problem is I, I do agree with you on both sides, it's true of the Remain side as well as the Leave side, people voted for a whole variety of different reasons. There were cross currents, there always are in these things. Uh, and and so, so, do you have a second referendum on what actually emerges? Now there, I'm even more of a maverick, I'm, total, I'm quite apart from most of the other you know, frustrated Remainers. I, I don't want ever to see another referendum in my lifetime, quite honestly. They're a complete gout lottery, spin a coin usually when you start the campaign. Uh, and the idea that 
having put a very complicated question about should Britain be a member of the European Union, you now put a question saying, have a look at this long list of, uh, of terms that we've now negotiated with 27 other states. Uh, do you approve of this or not? Uh, would be a folly, in my opinion. It would be bizarre. I'd, it'd love, quite how you debate it, I'm not quite sure. And what would happen is you'd go off on a tangent again, because as the last referendum did with our 70 million Turks going to come here to take our jobs, you know, we'll soon take over. And what happens if we have another referendum and this time my side of the argument wins it? How do we answer the Remainers who turn around and say, well, let's make it best of three, you know, <laughs> let's, let's have another one. Um, uh, so, uh, I think Parliament should get, be allowed to get back to its job and it should do its job properly, not be intimidated. Uh, I'm actually holding the government to account when the government has sorted out what it's negotiated and discovered what it can negotiate. And, and let, let's get back to a slightly more grown-up form of, of, of politics, I think. And then if Parliament makes a mess of it, one thing I have no doubt, whatever, is the public are entirely entitled to sack the lot of them if they've all made a mess of it. And, and uh, you go back to your constituency and you account for what you've done, and some of it's worked, some of it's not, and you argue for the good bits, and they return you if they believe it. Macron swept away vast numbers of uh, MPs out of the French National Assembly. Can I just, uh, we'll take some more questions the floor in a minute, but I just wanted to move away, just because all the questions about Brexit so far, and I'll be honest, I can only take so much Brexit, but... Uh, um, we debate it every single week in here as well. So, um, can I just ask you a few questions about uh, just about your personal life, apart from anything else? Because in your book, your book is called Kind of Blue, but that's actually a jazz reference, isn't it? Yes, it's one of the it, Miles Davis. My readers are divided half and half uh, between those who come across a bit of modern jazz and read to get the get the context of Kind of Blue, and those who just look at it and think, well, that's. A, it was a sort of description of my, my political role in life, you know, and, and, and uh, that, 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 that's, uh, and jazz is, is one of my enthusiasms. I get rather obsessive, usually, about the things I get keen on. I don't just have hobbies or interests. I suddenly start getting rather carried away. So for you, I'm not so much now, because I don't go to jazz clubs anymore. But, but I'd, I used to get quite immersed in jazz all over the world, get jazz clubs, and Ronnie Scott's I was a regular and I have vast numbers of records and things. And uh, the, 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 I think a lot of us get stuck in the, the music that enthused us at a formative age in our lives. The, 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 for those jazz people here, hard bop, blue note records, all that. That's my favorite type of jazz. I listen to every type of jazz. And when Miles Davis was emerging, his great quintet with John Coltrane, and that, that was when I really was getting every LP as it came out, because it was, was then, making the running in jazz. And, and uh, so kind of blues reaction to that. Nowadays, I've just got the odd CD in my car, and I'm driving up and down motorways, I play it, and I get to jazz very occasionally. But it, it's still the only music that really moves me. That's the only one that I get really bothered about. But uh, jazz is one of my great enthusiasms. Do, do, do you think MPs can have interest? I'm just, uh, intrigued. You've got a lot of interests outside politics. Uh, I just noticed this week, for example, a former colleague here, uh, Douglas Ross, who is he's now a Conservative MP, and he's also a linesman, and he, he runs the line at European matches. And he got criticised for going off. Absolutely savage it was, for it. Yes. It was Barcelona against somebody, wasn't it? Yeah. God, the SNP need to get a sense of proportion, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, no, no. It, it's, uh, well, good for him. You know, you, I think uh, the, the, all, the one, only thing, and my, my, mine are an eclectic collection of things. I mean, not many people are, are interested, and I have been a fanatic bird watcher. I became a fanatic bird watcher, a real conservationist. Not many people combine that with Formula One motor racing. They're the two are totally, but I'm a petrol head as well. Um, the, the only thing my interests have in common, I think, when I ask myself, well, what, what is it about my you know, makeup? Of course, you, you can't ever work out for yourself. Uh, it, it, it makes me so keen on these things. The one thing they all have gone, they're all things, when I'm engaged in them, when I'm at a race, when I'm bird watching, when I'm at a cricket match, 
all thoughts of politics, all thoughts of work, vanish. Uh, unless I, with some political colleague, and if we're not careful, we start talking about what is going on. But that's usually in the tea interval. And um, we don't wander around bird watching, chattering politics. It is a switch off. It's just to get another part of your being going and absorbed in something. It gives you a sense of proportion, gives you a, you know, brings you back to reality, stops you becoming too obsessive on the politics. So, yeah, I do all these things. I noticed, too, that your book was dedicated simply to Gillian, your wife. Yeah, and well, my, my wife, I lost my wife a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I was very, very dependent on Gillian. She, she, uh, she, I always say she, she knew that I was going to be a politician. She, that, that my mother-in-law could not get me to concentrate properly on the preparations for my wedding because I was at that time fighting a parliamentary election campaign in the general election and we got married a few days after it was over when I lost at Mansfield the first time. Uh, and then she, she knew I was very political at Cambridge. But the normality, the home life, the support, you know, she gave me was, was kept one sane, really, and stable. And she, it, looking back, I, you know, I, I, I think it, the sacrifices that she makes, it, this is true of most MPs, certainly ones to become ministers, First, you you've got to be a workaholic to uh, be actually uh, a cabinet minister, a senior one, because uh, you've got two jobs. You're being an MP and you are got a more than full-time job uh, as a senior thing. And so your family are often long away and, and uh, you know, your spouse, wife in my case, has really got all the responsibilities with an absent uh, partner uh, to keep the a normal home life together, bring up the children, all this kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, so I, de I dedicated it to my wife, not surprisingly, really. And I, I occasionally feel twinges of guilt. She, again, it's my generation. We just took it for granted. It's not just me, but quite a lot of our colleagues. Your, your wife gave up her career if the two clashed. And I, if, Half the graduate women I knew, and I did know some from Cambridge, and Gillian was one, uh, you know, when they went down, they became housewives quite rapidly because they could not combine the career they might otherwise have taken, not in those days, with their husbands, and it was just taken for granted that that would happen. She would have been an academic historian if she hadn't married me. Um, and obviously, I, we were married for 50 years, so suitably it's... Uh, Dedicated to my wife. I, I, I didn't. I, I play this down in the book. I was quite determined the book was going to be a political memoir, uh, not mainly because I do relish my privacy. I, I've never combined my private life with my public life. Ginian was very politically active, but again, as the MP's minister's wife, sort of role. But she was genuinely interested in politics. But um, so the book isn't going to lots and lots of stuff about uh, my private family life, particularly. Mm -hmm. It's me giving a political narrative late at night into a, a, a recording machine. But uh, the whole thing's dedicated to Gillian, because without her, the whole thing would have been quite impossible. I would never have been able to live a life as I did. You, you use a dictaphone, but you're not a big fan of technology. I should say we're live on Facebook here. So, I yes, I, I, I've never been on Facebook. I don't, I don't know what all these things are. They occasionally, my children show me bits of it, and I'm slightly appalled by it. There were several sites in my name on there at one point, but I think they've all gone. I just, my office just persuaded me to get one on Twitter taken down. If, if you're a B-list celebrity, if you, don't have a, if you don't go on internet and the social media, then jokers turn up and start going on in your name. So lots of bogus ones, and uh, I've had various bogus ones. But uh, otherwise, my children occasionally, who despair on me, show me political exchanges on the social media. And I realize, I, this, I realize I'm an old fogey on this. That's the way we're going. That's where future generations will get their news, and that's where the political debate will be. Most of the newspapers probably won't be in print in 10 years' time. Um, but but I don't, it tends to appall me because uh, the level of debate on Twitter and things is not, in my opinion, a staggeringly high level. 
and there is a tendency to resort to personal insult at the drop of a hat. Anybody you who you should read what they're saying here. <laughs> 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 yes, well, it's just... Yeah, I'd write it. I mean, why women MPs go on the, the social media, I cannot imagine. Uh, they just have to put up with the, the t t torrents of abuse. I'll give you a quick question from... From sad people in bedsits somewhere mm. in the globe, isn't it? Enjoying themselves sending insults to women politicians, they don't like. Why do that when you can be insulted in person in the House of Commons? Uh, Absolutely. So no, uh, yeah. <laughs> Rob, Rob on Facebook, he, he says... Uh, one of the things that it is a young person's medium for the most part, not necessarily Facebook. Yeah, it's under the age of 50, you know. And Rob asks about this, he says, that's young. That's, so. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a fair amount of societal and generational inequality. Uh, my generation blame the, put the blame on the deregulation of the 80s. What do you think about that? Uh, You're a deregulator. Yes, well, firstly, I, I think this intergenerational thing uh, it has a lot in it. Uh, and I think it's the going to having earlier given my racy personal theory of the problem of political democracy in the Western world has a lot to do with it. And I think my generation, if I again made a, I don't normally keep describing myself as an establishment man, but a mainstream politician of the 1990s, I think we did, this is the mistake we made. We made the country a much richer country. We raised the quality of life of most of its inhabitants, the actually on a global stage, the G7, the amount of poverty in the world plummeted as never before and never since as we were developing uh, with the structural reforms, uh, including the Thatcher ones, the modern, modern globalized economy. But we missed out badly on the distribution, what was happening to the distribution of the benefits missed out, if you like, on the social conscience bit I talked about, and in deregulating, and I think it was deregulating, but we failed to pay attention to the worsening climate for younger people and the quite extraordinary range of events which gave my generation all kinds of advantages which their children and grandchildren couldn't have. And this is, people have suddenly realized you took the 2007-2008 crash to exacerbate that, make it very much worse, and then to reveal just how serious it has become. Uh, but it does, does now need to be tackled, and free markets do need to be regulated. Uh, and we do need to look at aspects of the housing market, aspects of the savings market, aspects of our pension arrangements, uh, to give the same opportunities to people under the age of 50 that most people over the age of 50 did, without forgetting the fact that not everybody over the age of 50 has been that lucky, so we still have some quite hard up pensioners. So, but there are some, we have some very lucky pensioners. The, the housing market's gone so manic that everybody who's bought their own house, which is the majority of my generation, got all kinds of capital wealth just as a windfall, you know, manna from heaven. Uh, and uh, then our people we know, you know, under the age of 50, half of them can't even begin to start buying a house, and they're in about the same sort of position in society so that we were when we were much younger, but it's all totally changed. And, but the housing's the obvious thing, but there are several other areas where restoring opportunities to everybody to have a fair share of the benefits of whatever success we achieve is, should be one of the aims of politicians for the next few years. And it, you know, it, it, I, I repeat, so I'll stop repeating this again, but the, I think that is one of the explanation of why the voting habits of the public in so many reasonably prosperous and successful Western democracies have become so aberrant and so peculiar as they have become in recent times. We'll take a few more questions from the floor. I've got, a, I've got a, I know, a man here, then a woman in the balcony, and then some more people over there. So the man here first. Sorry, I know. Um, right, I was going to ask you another question about Brexit, but as time's chasing us, I'll just lighten the load a bit. Um, what is your favourite Knott's Forest moment, and what's your favourite <laughs> wine? <laughs> and what's the second? Favourite wine, favourite wine, and favourite Knott's Forest. Yeah. 
My favourite Nottingham Forest moment. Um, well, uh, we're in the European Cup, surely. I never got to either of the European Cup finals. And Nottingham Forest is all obsessed with the Clough years, which were the great years. Uh, but I didn't get to either of the finals. And, and, and uh, I go back before that. I think my favourite Forest moment, I mean, the Clough years were the great years, and Eric and Wax was lyric about it. He was the greatest manager of any football club since the war. Because I think either you or I, could have a go with Manchester United for a year or two with all that money and we might actually pick up the odd trophy. But for, to go to a couple of nondescript Midland football clubs like Derby County and Nottingham Forest, take the first one to the First Division Championship, fall out with the board, have a lunatic couple of months at Leeds and then turn up at another nondescript Midlands football club and take them to the First Division Championship and two European Cups. It's just lunatic. I mean, it's, uh, you, no one's ever going to repeat that. But the first time, we were um, in a fairly bad way after the Second World War. When I was a lad, I'd say I was following the least fashionable club. We got relegated from the Second Division down to the Third Division South. Uh, and we came, I, I was... We came steadily back from that and got back to the first division, and we won the cup in about 1959. And I, 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 I was at school, later years in school, so going to Wembley to see what's probably the most unfashionable English cup final since the war: Nottingham Forest versus Luton Town. <laughs> uh, I, I, I went down with a friend of mine from the sixth form at my school in Nottingham, and he hadn't got a ticket. I'd somehow managed to get a ticket. And five minutes to kick off, he was able to buy one at face value because the touts couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it, it was a great match. We, we, I still remember it. Half the matches I go to, I, I couldn't remember this season, but we went rapidly into the lead. I think we were 2-0 on the lead. I, I'm now making mistakes, but... And then we had one of our players injured, and there were no substitutes in those days. And a man called Roy Dwight had his leg broken, never played again. Uh, 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 and we had to spend the last hour of the game defending our lead, which was reduced to one goal. So the, the moment when we actually won the FA Cup final, which when I'd started to watch Nottingham Forest would have been regarded as a preposterous idea because the cup final was then the great football trophy. Uh, that's probably my favourite Forest moment. Sounds like Theresa May and the government, you know, ten men and a broken leg. And <laughs> <laughs> Can I say the woman in the balcony there? You can think about the wine as well. The woman in the balcony. Mr Clark, can I appeal to your experience as Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, regarding the economy? We've gone through a long period of austerity where a lot of people have suffered a lot, such as the nurses, the police, there have been tremendous cuts in society. And yet suddenly we have enormous billions to spend on Northern Ireland, on the, the Brexit, on paying over special sums for our oh, debt, etc. What is your opinion of this? I'm sorry, that always yes. repeated me. It's been, we've gone from austerity, suddenly we've got billions to spend on Northern Ireland or on Brexit. Is that really a good use of public money? Well, I mean, uh, yes, I'd be careful. No, I'm, I'm being very candid because I am a cavalier maverick backbencher now, and I, uh, <laughs> there's no reason, there's no point in my carrying on in politics if I'm not actually giving my views, but I better not upset my colleagues too much. Um, the, 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 I, I am a fiscal hawk, uh, and I, I am worried about the state of the public finances. I think we, we do need to explain to people that it's not sustainable uh, to keep borrowing money as we are, adding to the stock of debt when we've already up to 80% GDP, but which is some of my generation, is impossible. It's one of the very biggest parts of our expenditure as a government now is the interest on all this debt. Uh, and we, we haven't really had austerity. Uh, we managed to steer away from the crisis in 2010. So compared with the... You know, if the, it, the British all tell themselves with a terrible period of austerity, it must come to an end now. If you meet an Irish or Portuguese or Greek or, you know, we, don't, we haven't seen anything. Uh, 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 and so far we've avoided all that. Now, I'm not in favour of accelerating the tightening up. Uh, 
at a time when the economy is very fragile and has slowed down. But it would be a great mistake, in my opinion, to think that, oh, let's forget all this nonsense, you know, let's just print and borrow a lot more and throw a lot of money about. That way, that way disaster lies. That, that's how the Greeks got where they are. You know. And uh, so they're my views on, 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 on the finances of it. You deal with the Northern Irish? Well, Northern Irish politics is always about negotiating. So I had nothing to do with it. I was just an observer of all this, but uh, they, they drive a hard bargain. Uh, on all sides in Northern Irish politics. If you think of it, it's the politicized society of the United Kingdom, very dangerous at times, has been for many years, and they're all tremendous experts at negotiating. So they drove quite a hard deal. Um, and uh, you say, throwing money at Brexit, we haven't thrown much money at Brexit. All this argument about the money, which is very important, how much, how we are going to, our financial obligations are going to come to an end in Europe. But it's all being, it's mainly all the attention in the press is on it because it's the one thing that everybody understands. Um, are we paying money to foreigners? It lends itself to much more lively reporting uh, than what would be the consequences of leaving the, or modifying the customs union or whatever it happens to be or, what, 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 what do you think of uh, the decision to leave your atom and, and all this sort of thing? Um, so, the, we, throughout the, the whole single market particularly, but the whole European project's been based on the fact that the richer countries pay more in than they take out, it obviously has a budget, and the poorer countries take out more than they put in. So the British have always paid in, and we've always argued about how much, but along with the Germans and the Dutch and even the Norwegians from outside, uh, we're net contributors. Uh, and the Germans, the Dutch and the British always paid on the basis that the sums of money involved, though they get quite large, are trivial compared with the economic benefits of having access to that huge market. No one's ever said we should stop paying into the budget. And now, with these closed years, you have a problem of calculating how much is needed to be paid to end our liabilities. And for so long as we get benefits, as long as we, through a transition period, enjoy free trade, then just like the Germans and the Dutch, we, you can't negotiate with the German Chancellor and expect her to go back home and say to the German taxpayer, well, we've got to pay more money now because the British can enjoy the benefits for free uh, that previously they paid for uh, like we do. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't sell that to... You can't negotiate with people asking them to go away making idiot demands of their own clients, their own public. Um, so it's a question of how much. And then there are all... There's the things we've already signed up and agreed to. Uh, then there's inherited debts and obligations and assets. Half the world's got unfen unfunded pensions liabilities. And as long as we were in, we were one of the countries running up these unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, when we leave, what's our share of the unfunded pension liabilities? Very boring technical subject when you find out. I'm very glad I'm not going to be the one in the end negotiating the figure. They haven't got around to figures yet, but again, the media and the populist politicians know what the public's interested in, so currently, apparently, Theresa's offered 20 billion. I've never heard Theresa offer 20 billion, and the speech that was reported in that way doesn't have a figure in it. I've never heard her give a figure nor have I heard a figure that anybody demanded on the other side. They were trying to work out yesterday that Macron said we weren't halfway there, so he's demanding 40 billion. Well, this is all rubbish. Uh, the, 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 but the, the, the principle needs to be agreed and established, and then we, of course, we'll pay money. Um, if you just say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're free now, we're a sovereign nation, forget it. You know, you sort it out, we're paying nothing, we're not undertaking our obligations, we're leaving. I don't know how you think you're going to get on 
with the first trade deal in the wider world, you're trying to negotiate. If you think you can go to New Zealand, let's take the friendliest country in the world where we might do a trade deal if we were suddenly found ourselves on our own. Uh, if you begin by saying, well, of course, we're not going to be tied by any obligations ourselves. We'll agree to some mutual rules and so on, but we are a sovereign nation. We, we are going to change them sometimes. We're not, uh, and, if, and there are disputes, so we're not going to your funny foreign courts. No, 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 no. Uh, you'll have to take it through the British courts if you want to sort out disputes with us. Well, I don't think you get off square one with the New Zealanders. There's quite a lot of other tricky points with the New Zealanders as well. Uh, but but you, you can't behave like that. Uh, and uh, so eventually there will be a bargain and there will be an agreement about how much the British are going to steadily over the transition period pay for their past obligations, past liabilities, and whatever benefits we're still getting through the transition period. Um, but that... I deliberately put it in what I think is a perfectly accurate, factual way, but that's more boring than, you know, Theresa said 20, Macron said 40, you know, pistols at dawn. Uh, and, of course, stout Eurosceptics say nothing, go whistle for it, and, uh, and so on, which is sooner or later we've got to move on from that. Ken, can I just say that? So we, we began with Brexit. We were finishing with Brexit. It is rather uh, the mood of the day, it isn't is, it, yes, really? It is, yes, and... Uh, <laughs> We'll put, if we're not careful, this is, these are political enthusiasts. We're all political enthusiasts coming to a festival of politics. But we'll put even more of the public off politics if it's all yes, Brexit they are, they are. for the next three years. You can understand what So I'm, I'm going to have to end with an apology to, particularly there's so many hands going up there, but can I suggest, I think Ken's going to make himself available downstairs to sign copies of your book. Am I right in thinking that? Yes, yes. so the bookseller will insist I don't have a long conversation with everybody who comes up, but I'm around. Yes, <laughs> it's all. Keep your, short, your And the people short. in the queue will deeply object if I'm actually busily arguing, I don't know, over uh, yes. the politics of health or something with the person who's in front of the queue. So. Well, short points, I think we are welcome. Can I just say thank you very much to, to you, our, our audience, uh, and, and to our audience on Facebook Live as well. Thank you very much for coming along today, and can I ask you to join me in thanking Ken Clark. Yes.